Well, now we come to this evening's lecture. There's a citation to be read, which I will ask Miles Paget here to read. Thank you very much, President. The James Scott Prize Lectureship was established in 1918 in memory of James Scott, a farmer, now I may get the pronunciation wrong here, in East Pittenriach, near Brecon, by the trustees of his bequest. This prize is awarded every four years for a lecture on the fundamental concepts in natural philosophy. This year's award goes to Professor Steve Barnett, who is not only a fellow of this society, but a fellow of the Royal Society in London, who is based in the Department of Physics at the University of Strathclyde. Steve is one of the world's most eminent scientists in the field of quantum optics, a previous winner of the Institute of Physics Maxwell Medal, and there's the link to Maxwell already. He is perhaps best known for his co-discovery of the Barnard peg phase operator. This established the first formally correct approach for handling both angles and phase as descriptions within quantum systems. Still within quantum physics, Steve holds a number of patents relating to techniques for writing unbreakable codes. For a subject that is potentially beyond most people's understanding, Professor Barnett is well known for presenting the counter common sense implications of quantum mechanics in an accessible and, as we will see shortly, entertaining way. Feel no pressure, Steve. <laughs> uh, stripping the subject bare of its supporting mathematics, leaving only the essence of pure ideas. I look forward to Steve's lecture and congratulate him on being a very worthy winner of the James Scott Prize Lectureship. I've got to introduce the lecturer still. <laughs> Very keen. Uh, and let me just say, I hope he doesn't strip away all the mathematics, uh, as a mathematician myself. Um, I, I would like to say a few words. Uh, that there is some mathematics behind all this. In fact, it's very pure mathematics. Uh, it's, it's concerned with things like prime numbers somewhere. And uh, there's a nice story which I can't resist telling you. Famous pure mathematician G.H. Hardy, um, who was one of the most distinguished mathematicians in the early part of this century, he was so pure, he didn't like anything he did to be used, applied. And he said, the sort of things I'm working on have never been of any use to anybody and will never be any use in the future. I was delighted to say, well, he turned out to be wrong. You, know, you never know when people will find uses for the most useless ideas. And so I hope you'll, there'll be enough mathematics to sh show you that that actually is true. Well, that in a few words, and I introduce Professor Barnett to talk about security, paranoia, and quantum mechanics. Well, thank you for those kind words. I shall do my best to uh, both put some mathematics in and not put the mathematics in, and, uh, well, hopefully we'll have some sort of balance. The, um, I think the title, Security, Insecurity, Paranoia, and Quantum Mechanics, hopefully, as the lecture goes on, it will become clear. For those of you who are not specialists, I would ask you to concentrate on this one word here, which is a, <laughs> an unusual choice of word in an academic lecture, and especially in a physics one. But if, I, if, if by the end of the lecture I leave you feeling a little bit more cautious about the way you use your ATM card or internet transactions, then maybe well, I will achieve something of, of use. So let's start with that. I'm prepared to wager that probably everybody in this room has got one of these, an ATM card, ATM. And of course, what you do with that is you stick it in a hole in the wall, you type in some four digits here, and you, uh, if you're lucky, you extract some money. <clears throat> of course, what you should bear in mind is that the, this number here is not to protect you, it's to protect the bank. Why? Well, all, what you've done is you've put in the card, you've put in the PIN number, all the bank machine has done is give you money. And money is much less useful than information. With that in mind, some idea of the scale of the problem is that cash machine fraud, and I'm not talking about internet transactions and this, I'm talking purely about ATM fraud, nets thieves in the UK alone about £100 million a year. Several of you, statistically at least, in this room will have been victims of it. When I first started working in this subject nearly 20 years ago, the computer hacking was something which nobody particularly worried very much about, and these days it's in the newspapers all the time. But I still like showing this example. It's not that long ago. This is from... The Times in London, February the 16th, 2000, 
And it says, internet pests put words in Clinton's mouth. And for those of you with short memories, this is the husband, not the wife. <laughs> I'll just blow up these things because it's not so easy to read. It says, President Clinton had an astonishing confession to make. Personally, he said, I would like to see more porn on the internet. And it goes on to explain what had happened. Mr. Clinton had given his first live online interview to CNN, the news corporation, which was confident that it had the technology to stop interference with its website for the duration. Instead, pranksters had a field day posting rival remarks that were attributed to Mr. Clinton and asking impertinent questions. If CNN and the White House aren't secure, which of us is? So here's a, a salient point. When you, look at, uh, uh, when you look at the security of information at its most fundamental level, it always comes down to communications. If you don't need to communicate, you can physically isolate, you can hide. But if you need to communicate, then, you're, then, you have to, then it's usually the communication that's the weak link in the uh, process. By the same token, if you can communicate secure, securely, then you can have secure transactions, spend money securely, and so on. The first idea, the simplest idea, and historically the oldest idea for securing information, essentially is this one. Now, of course, this isn't the way it's done, but I want to give you just a flavor of the concept. So here's the first, first of all, I introduce the characters in the game. We always call the person who's sending the message Alice. We always send, call the person who's receiving the message Bob. So the message goes from Alice to Bob. And we'll meet the third a member of this cast of characters, Evil Eve, the eavesdropper, a little bit later on. So the idea is, of course, that Alice and Bob are remote from each other, and Alice wants to send this important piece of secret information to Bob in such a way that it can't be intercepted. And in single-key cryptography, what Alice is doing effectively is locking up the information in a box, metaphorically, but inside a box, a nice strong box with a key. The box then goes in transit, and hopefully this can't be broken into. And Bob at the other end, because he's got a copy of the same key, he can undo it and read the message. And there are several issues that we have to worry about. Well, first of all, is it really secret? Well, it's secret if these two guys have got the same key, and that in itself is a problem because you have to distribute the keys. Um, it's, of course, as I say, it's got to be the same key. And at the bottom line, is it actually secure? Especially as, of course, there, are no, there aren't really any boxes. What we're really talking about in the modern world is transferring data securely. So what, what, the, what we start off with is the information, which is just a string of bits, and we live in the digital age, so all messages are strings of bits, zeros and ones. This box is a mathematical transformation. So we take this long series of zeros and ones, which is basically just a big number, we perform a mathematical operation on it, and we send this transformed garbled number in such a way that Bob at the other end can undo it and read the message. So just to emphasize that, that same point, here are, the, here are the ingredients. We've got Alice's side over here who's going to send the message. We've got Bob's side over here who's going to hopefully receive the message. And the idea is we've got this unprotected data. That's the message that's going to be sent. We've got this mathematical transformation into which this key, this secret number, is fed. And Bob, because he's got the copy of the same key, can perform the inverse transformation and get the data out. Let's look at this issue of whether there's such a, an idea is secure or not. And this uh, comparatively simple construction is, in fact, the first demonstrably perfectly secure method of communication of information. It's called the one-time pad or the Vernam cipher. It was proved to be secure in 1949. So as I said, we start off with our message, which, of course, is just a string of zeros and ones, uh, all of them for all of them. Um, Information in a digital age is just reduced to a string of zeros and ones. And the idea is that we have the message and we have the key, which is a random number, a random string of zeros and ones, which is the same length as the message. The scrambling operation that you perform on these is to do what we call modulo addition. Now, modulo addition is very simple. Here we've got the digits from the message. Here we've got the digits from the key. And very simply, if, you, if the two are the same, so if they're both zero, you put in a zero. If they're both one, you put in a zero. If one is a zero and one is a one, you put in a one. So adding those two together like that makes this thing, the, the, cut, the, the uh, cryptogram or the ciphertext. And it's this which is transmitted through this open channel to, to Bob. And of course, somebody can be listening in. They can read this thing, this ciphertext. At the other end, 
Bob pr pr proceeds to perform exactly the same operation. He just adds in the key once more and gets back the message. And that's secure if, as I said, if the key is the same length as a message and for technical reasons if it's used only once, hence the one-time pad. Here's, um, here's another model. And it's a, it's a different sort of philosophy. Again, I'll, I'll describe it in terms of boxes. Let's suppose that we've got this case, and instead of having one lock, we have two. Now, why would he do this? The difficulty with communication in single-key uh, cryptography is that you also have to distribute the key. So Alice has to send this secret number to Bob in such a way, of course, that it really is secure, otherwise somebody else can uh, also read the message. And, <clears throat> of course, they're already at a remote uh, location. So there's an element of the chicken and egg here. If you've got the means to send a secure, streak, a secure number, a secure message, you don't need the means to send a secure message. So it's this chicken and egg problem which, is, uh, which, is, uh, which, we're, which we're looking at. So much better, then, if in principle we could make a box like this, which has got not one lock, but two. And let's suppose that Alice has got the key for this lock, and Bob's got the key for that one. Then you see what can happen is that Alice can take the message she wants to send, put it inside the box and lock it with her key, and of course send it to Bob. Of course it's locked all the way through here, it can't be read. Bob can't unlock that clock, but he can lock his own. So that it's now doubly locked. Sends it back to Alice, who undoes her lock, who sends it to Bob and undoes his lock. You see, it's been locked, it's gone, it's gone backwards and forwards, it's had uh, three transmissions, but it's been locked every time. Bob doesn't need to have Alice's key, he only needs his own. And then you can read the message at the bottom. Hardly news. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, and it doesn't work for this reason. Let's, let's follow, and see, let's follow what, what, uh, what would have happened here if we tried this. M is the message. And Alice adds in this key, her own secret cipher key, to make up this cipher text. Now, this is a random number because that's a random number. So this is, this is completely unreadable either by an eavesdropper or indeed by uh, Bob. Bob locks the case, and it's even more uh, garbled up because it's actually added in two random numbers, this key and that one, to make a second random number. We'll do the third one. Alice unlocks the case. So she undoes her key, but it's still, and sends back this message, but of course it's still locked with Bob's key. That's a third random number. And it's completely hopeless because the eavesdropper can't get any information out of this one or out of that one or out of that one. If she adds all three together, she gets back the message. So although each of these three are random numbers, they're not independent, if you add all three together, you get the message. And so it doesn't work. The, the reason it doesn't work, in fact, is, is the simplicity of modulo addition. There are techniques, Diffie and Hellman were the first, based on modulo arithmetic and, indeed, prime numbers, which allow you to solve this problem. But I won't go into that. It's rather technical, and it's been, used, it's been replaced by something that's a little bit more, more um, user-friendly, and that's the one I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> the, uh, this one-time pad is uh, very onerous as well. You need an awful lot of information. If you think about the number of bits which make up and even the simplest of messages you might want to send, then you'll realize that very rapidly you need large amounts, large amounts of key data in order to make all of the messages secure. So except for where security is really desperately important, we tend not to do that. Instead, what you have is you use a shorter key. So instead of using a, a number which is the same length, the same number of digits, as the message you want to send, you choose, you choose a shorter key. Uh, 56 was in favor till about 10 years ago. 128 is, uh, is, is more normal now, using something like the so-called data encryption standard or advanced encryption standard. Incidentally, um, just perhaps to sow the first seeds of doubt, data encryption standard and advanced encryption standard are licensed for use to transfer secure information, uh, to, to secure messages by security agencies. Now, the typical brief in a place like GCHQ is to be 10 years ahead of state of the art. And we're using a method for our secure communications that the government and these organizations suggested that we should use. I, 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 mean, I say nothing more, that's, that's what, but, that's, <laughs> but that's, that's how it's done. So 56-bit uh, DES is, is, is now largely discredited for reasons we'll see. And the 128-bit one, especially with the advanced encryption standard, is now used. So you have a long message. You fold in this 128 bits of secret of, of shared key, do your transformation, again using this licensed transformation, 
send this box along, and Bob, who's got the same key, uh, can open it. So how easy is it to break? That's a four let, let me just think about a simple example, which is 40 bits long. So again, it's far too short. This is what a 40-bit number looks like. It's a row of 40 ones and zeros. So let's suppose we were trying to break a, a code which was, in, which was encoded using 40 bits. Now, if you look at the, each, of, each of these entries can be a 1 or a 0. So there's 2 times 2 times, well, it's 2 to the 40 different keys, which is a million million, 10 to the 12. So let's see, if we tried to break this, of course, one way, one way we could go is do an exhaustive key search. What we could do is we could try every one of these possible 2 to the 40 or million million possible keys, try and unlock the transformation, and of course the one that makes sense is the, is the, is the right message. And to give you some idea of the problem, if I, if I tried this, this exhaustive key search with a machine that was capable of a million decryption operations a minute, in other words, if I could try a million of these keys, sorry, in every second, to break this it would take six days. And you might think, okay, I'm prepared to live with that. If it's, if it's a message which I need to keep secure to the end of the day, six days will do. But it's crackable in under an hour. Actually, no, that's not true. Um, I, British Telecom admitted uh, 10 years ago they could do this in an hour. What the best is now, I don't know. So the point is that it seems, as, it seems a reasonable estimate, but as with all of these situations, it seems secure is not good enough because there are better things to try than just an exhaustive key search. What about 128 bits? As, as, as I mentioned, 128-bit key is now the recommended one. That's what a string of 128 zeros and ones looks like. So that's your 128 digits. You've got two to the 128, which is, oh my word. Um, uh, no, I, I'm not going to attempt to count up the zeros. You get the idea. If you were doing an exhaustive key search, it would take you a billion, billion years or about uh, 10 to the 18 years, give or take a day or so. But, as I've mentioned, of course, there are better ways of cracking it. There are better ways of tackling it. And so, basically, we, we, we hope, in using a, using a system like this, we hope that this is good enough. Now, in all of this single-key cryptography work, what's been hanging over us, as I mentioned, is the difficulty in making sure that you share this secret key, this secret number, with a distant um, user. Now, the, it doesn't have to be this way. What I'm going to try to describe to you now, and hopefully the president will be happy because there's some prime numbers and some mathematics uh, in this, is a system called public key cryptography. And here the idea is very different. Here the idea is essentially that supposing you could construct a lock, thinking again in terms of the box, in which the key you require to lock it is different from the key you require to open it. Very strange idea, but in principle we can, we can work with that idea. If we can do that, then what each recipient can do, Bob can do, is he can keep his own unlocking key and give every, as many people as he likes, he can publish the locking key. Then anybody they like can use the published locking key or their copy to lock the message, hopefully in such a way that Bob, who's got the unlocking key, is the only person who can undo the lock. Now, as I mentioned, this, is, uh, this of course, is... Um, these locks are mathematical transformations, and the first idea was, in fact, published by, it's called the RSA scheme, it's now almost universally used, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. And I remember I mentioned the idea that security agencies are supposed to be 10 years ahead of state of the art. It only transpi transpired later that, in fact, GCHQ had got there 10 years earlier but didn't publish. So it was already known. Well, no, it wasn't known, it was known to those who knew it. <laughs> no, I don't, no, no, no. So here's, the, here's how it works. What you need is you need an, a, a data, X. That's just the message, a long number. And you need two large primes, P and Q. So remember, prime numbers are numbers which are divisible only by themselves or by one. And we'll come to how large these numbers have to be in a moment. Then the first step, and somebody who's trying to set one of these schemes up has to do, is to calculate the product of these two. So take P and Q, multiply them together, and make the number N, which of course is even bigger. Then it gets a little bit tricky. You have to find two numbers, E and D, such that the product of these two is one modulo this thing. So in other words, you calculate the product of E and E, you divide through by this P minus one, Q minus one, keep the remainder, and that's your modulo. Now I won't explain how this is done, but it suffice it to say that there are efficient algorithms for doing this. You can do this with a com reasonable computer, even with a, even with a laptop, if you know P and Q. 
And then what Bob does is he publishes these two numbers, n and e. So the, big, the product of the primes and this number here, which is the, what we call the encryption exponent. And he keeps this other number, d, secret. Then anybody who wants to send him a message raises x to the power of e, modulo n, and decryption, e, because e times d essentially is 1, this, become, this gives back the message. So the encryption is with one key, that's e, and of course it can be done because the sender knows n, and decryption is done with this key. Now, how we get, what is this business of the numbers? Why is it secure? Well, f first of all, we, say we don't know it's secure. There's no proof that this is secure, but we know why it's hard, which is almost the same. Well, almost the same. And what it really comes down to is that all of the steps in generating this, uh, this system are easy if you know the prime numbers. And so it is believed, but has not been proven to be true, that the difficulty of cracking this is the difficulty of extracting the, numbers, the prime numbers P and Q from, I'm sorry, change of notation, from their product. P times Q is N, P times Q is M, Finding M from P and Q is easy, going back is not. So how big does this number have to be? Well, numbers of about 10 to the 90, that's 90 digits long, can be factored in about a day. So that's much too small. Now those of you who like a challenge, there's a prize. One way that the, uh, the, the uh, relevant organizations keep track of this is there's a factoring prize. This is the smallest outstanding number waiting to be factorized. And if, you, if you're lucky enough to do it, you can win $30,000. Yeah, big deal. RSA 704 is this 176-digit number, which we're told is the product of two large prime numbers. If you can find those two prime factors, you'll be $30,000 richer. My best, actually, if you find an efficient way of doing this, there are actually better things to do than claim this prize, but I'll tell you about that in a little while. <laughs> but if any case, anybody does fancy it, I'm very happy to send you that number. And of course, there are bigger ones as well for bigger prizes. I think the highest prize is half a million dollars for the biggest number. Um, you may like to know that the, the, the one smaller than this, the last time one of these prizes was claimed was 1991. So 16 years this one has stood. What do we do with this public cryptography? Well, the, the difficulty with this, you'll have appreciated that this finding big prime numbers, multiplying them together, multiplying, taking the message to some power and so on, is very computationally intensive, it's slow. Single key cryptography is fast. And so what we tend to do is we tend to use public key cryptography for sending the secret keys. You remember these short keys, these 128-bit keys, or the one-time pads? We tend to use this scheme for sending them. Now, years ago, before this came online, the, the, the site of the uh, motorcycle outsider rider between uh, different financial institutions in the city of London was a pretty common occurrence. And he was often as not carrying around things like cryptographic keys between institutions. Not necessarily anymore. It's done using this thing called RSA. So that's the way in which, for example, banks exchange secure information. It's the way that they set up these keys with which to talk to each other and transfer money. And then, of course, once you've got this secret key, you can use it to talk to each other uh, using something like the advanced encryption standard or one-time uh, pad. Here's another simple operation which you can perform. And this is very much increasingly the way that people, and not just people, but banks and other financial institutions, spend money. How do you spend money securely by electronic communications? Remember, of course, money is not this folding stuff anymore. The real money is numbers in computer files. Well, here's what you do. Remember that we have this, pu this, pu this public key and this private key. How does Bob tell Alice, for example, that he is, how does he prove that he is indeed who he is electronically? And the answer is, here's your message, whatever it is, buy a million shares in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, put it up here, and, and sign it in such a way. Well, in fact, what he does is he signs it using his private key. Remember that we've got the, the original idea was that, you, that a message could be sent to Bob using the public key, and th this message could only be read by Bob using the private key. Here the idea is different. You're trying to generate a message to send to Alice, not that's secret, but that can be only, could only have been written by you and that's an electronic signature or a digital signature. So you do the, pro the process in reverse. You take this unsigned message, and you do, instead of signing it with, with, um, with Alice's uh, public key, you sign it with your own private key. Then anybody can read it, but you're the only person who could have written it. And that's the way you write an electronic check. That's how you transfer funds. And again, it's secure if RSA is secure, or in other words, as far as we know, if you can't solve the factoring problem. Now, those of you who aren't physicists, 
Um, this slide's not important. But for those of you who are, you'll probably feel the need for some of this stuff by now. So this is just to explain some of those little equations and symbols that are going to be going, to be going on in the sidelines. Just a quick reminder. In uh, quantum mechanics, we put together each, each observable, each, everything we want to measure, is going to be associated with an operator. It'll have a set of real eigenvalues. And these are the results of the measurements of the, which can be formed. If you perform a measurement of the observable, these are the possible measurement outcomes. And these are the eigenstates, the states associated with those. We can make superpositions, is the important point. We don't have to have just have these eigenstates. We can make superpositions of them. And once we've done that, inevitably, if we perform a measurement of this property, we don't get a deterministic result, but a probabilistic one. So the probability of getting this particular result is given by the, this modulus squared. But the key point is we can make these superpositions. Actually, yeah, when I first started working in this field, again with the, the people at British Telecom, um, I, we, for the first patent we filed, I had a rather alarming re report from um, an agency I'm not allowed to mention who said that I wasn't allowed to work on this. So in fact, when I tried, first tried filing my first patent, I was told I wasn't security cleared to work on it. So let's have a look at this superposition principle in a more physical way. The, um, the physical system that we're going to be most interested in, the, the picture to have in mind, is the idea of uh, photon polarization. So the idea is if you think in terms of light traveling out of the screen towards you, um, the electric field associated with that, light's electromagnetic waves, will have a, plane, will have a vibration, uh, a, a plane of vibration. And it can be vibrating horizontally or vertically. And we're going to think in terms of these state, these possibilities, these orthogonal possibilities, as representing in some sense our logical zero and one, rather like we had in the zero and one in our bit string earlier on. And of course, we can have other possibilities, different planes of vibration, or indeed the like, the, 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 the um, electric field can be rotating, so I can have circular polarization as well. But the key point is we have superpositions, and this is going to tell us that we can't make all the measurements that we might like to have. We don't need that. The only other piece of information we need to know is that if we've only got a single photon, one, one elementary <laughs> quantum, one particle of light, when we detect it, we only get one click. So if I make this one of these superpositions, and put it through this rather nice device called a polarizing beam splitter, what happens is that vertically polarized light comes up here, horizontally polarized light comes over here. So the idea is that essentially you'll get a click here or you'll get a click here. But if I've got some superposition, all I can say is, a pro all I can give you is a probability that I'll get a click in this box and I get a click over here. In fact, it's given by the modulus squared of these amplitudes in this superposition. But the important point is that if I, if I give you a photon and I tell you it's prepared in one of these six possible polarizations, so vertical, horizontal, the two diagonal ones, and the circular ones, and you send it through that device, and you get a click up here, well, you know, remember, this transmits horizontally polarized light, so you know it's not that one, but it could be any one of the other five. Likewise, if I get a click over here, well, I know it wasn't this one, but it could be any one of the other five. And it's that simple idea that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, underlies the security of, supposed security of quantum key distribution, which is what we're going to come to. So this is a rather radically different way of solving the problem of sharing this secret string of digits which you can use for single key cryptography. This is the first idea that was, which was uh, proposed. It was proposed in uh, 1984 by a couple of uh, computer scientists. So here's, here's where we start. We start as before. Alice, the person who wants, who's going to send out this key, starts off with a random sequence of zeros and ones. But instead of, sending, trying to, instead of making this into a key, instead of sending this sequence of zeros and ones to Bob, there's one intermediate step. And that is, she chooses randomly for each of these whether to prepare a photon which is linearly polarized, so in other words, vertical polarization for the one, horizontal for the zero, or circularly polarized. So right circular polarized for the one, or left circularly polarized for the zero. So here's, a, here's an example. This is the beginning of that sequence, the zeros and ones. And what's prepared here, a circularly polarized, then a linear, circle, 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 linear, and so on. Why is that a problem? Well, the problem is, if somebody wants to listen in, they don't know whether to make a measurement of circular polarization or of linear polarization. And as we saw, you can't tell the difference. So let's see what might happen. This is one of the possibilities. Supposing Alice has prepared a one, which is one of these circularly polarized photons. And there's an eavesdropper listening in. I knew it. Here's, here's, here's Eve, the eavesdropper. Very imaginative, these names, aren't they? 
Eve the eavesdropper, and let's suppose that Eve decides to measure linear polarization. Well, she's going to get an answer. It doesn't matter what it is, but let's just say it's vertically, vertically polarization. The next thing she has to do is, of course, she's absorbed this photon. In order to share the same key as Alice and Bob, she's going to have to send a photon on to Bob. And the only thing she can do, the best thing she can do, is make a photon polarized in this direction. But now she's prepared a linear polarization. If Bob measures circular polarization, he's going to get the wrong answer some of the time. And so if somebody's listening in, they're going to create errors in this key. And that's the, that's the main point in this process. So the technique is to try to find up, come up with a protocol, a sequence of operations performed by Alice and by Bob, such that if there's an eavesdropper around, they'll be discovered. And if an eavesdropper is discovered, you can't use the key. If there's no eavesdropper there, you're safe. So here essentially is how it works. I've got a sequence of time bins up here. And in each of these, this is the sequence of ones and zeros that Alice has prepared. This is the sequence of polarizations, some of them circular, some of them linear, that she sends down to Bob. Bob at his other end, of course, he doesn't know what to do. He just decides to make a measurement, either linear or circular polarization. Sometimes he'll guess right, as here. Sometimes he'll guess wrong, as here. But, of course, at this stage, all that's happened is the photons have traveled down. Bob has made measurements. The next thing that happens is that Bob announces to, e, uh, to, uh, to Alice, and indeed to anyone else who's listening in, whether he measured linear polarization or circular polarization. Not what the answer was, not what the, not what the observed result was, of course, but just which of these two he measured. And then Alice can say, throw that one away, that's a good one, throw that one away, oops, you didn't receive that one, it got absorbed, keep that one, keep that one, keep that one, keep that one, throw that one away. And once that's done, if there's no other intervention, these measurement results should perfectly measure these prep match these preparation results. And that's the secret key. What happens if there's an eavesdropper? Well, in order to get any information out, Eve sitting in the middle is going to have to do a measurement, and she can't do much better than do exactly what Bob does. And the key idea here is that sometimes she'll guess, she has to make a, a straight guess. Sometimes she'll guess to measure the same, where are we? Sometimes she'll, she'll guess to measure the same as Alice and Bob. Sometimes she'll measure differently, and that will induce an error. See, there's a zero here and a one here. So by taking this key that's been generated in this way, or the sequence of ones and zeros that's been generated in this way, and then comparing a small subset of them, they can look for errors. And if there are errors, they have to infer that somebody was listening in and throw the message away. If there are no errors, then nobody was listening in, and you can use the key safely. So the idea is that what this, what this allows you to do is to, to, to find a way to communicate information and know if anyone's been listening. And that's good enough to prove security. Uh, I wouldn't want you to get the impression that this is a, a, an abstract system. It's by, any, by no means is, is it an abstract system. The, uh, the first experiment was, was uh, published in uh, 1989 uh, using uh, light-emitting diodes to work over a distance of 30 centimeters at one bit per second, which is hardly meteoric. But by good fortune, the optical fiber communications uh, sector was, was waiting and ready for this sort of idea. They've been interested in quantum optics for many years. And so within a few years, communications over kilometers at kilobits and then megabits of uh, uh, communication rates were actually being done quite routinely in a number of labs around the world. And in particular, for a more contemporary system up to something like gigahertz clock rates, this is a, a schematic from the laboratory of my uh, colleague Gerald Buller at Harriet Watt University. It uses a slightly different scheme, but the key, point to, the key idea to point out is that of distances of kilometer-ish and gigahertz rates are now becoming quite or clock rates, anyway, are becoming uh, accessible. Why only a kilometer or so, you might say? Well, glass fiber is incredibly transparent. But if you have kilometers and kilometers of just about anything, eventually you get absorption. And so this is what happens. That for this distance on the scale here is in kilometers, what happens is that the amount of photons that are actually surviving drops off very, really rather alarmingly. Uh, of course, you also lose about an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, in what you can have, what you can measure, due to essentially post-processing, eliminating errors, checking for if an eavesdropper listening on, and so on. And so this number falls off pretty quickly. If you're interested in trying to wire up all of the financial institutions in the City of London, for example, this is probably a pretty practical, or very nearly practical, uh, scheme. If you want to ex exchange secure information in this way with somebody in New York, you better do it this way. And this is a realistic proposal. There are missions planned. The idea is, let's suppose we've got a low Earth orbit satellite. And when it passes over, oh, it seems to have chopped Scotland off. Never mind. 
Yes. When it passes over you, you can talk to the satellite and exchange a key with the satellite. And then when the satellite passes over New York, you can download it over there. And that's proposed a re as proposed as a realistic scheme for doing quantum communications between uh, distant yeah, users. But, but why? <coughs> Nobody yet has managed to factor that 176-digit number. And if they do, well, we'll just make a bigger one. I mean, come on, nobody can solve the factoring problem. Surely RSA is secure. Hmm, is it? Quantum mechanics has a, another, another, another uh, throw of the dice. And in order to appreciate that, I'm going to have to introduce you to an idea. And at the moment, it is only an idea. There are no devices, but, uh, but uh, my experimental colleagues are clever people, so you don't know. And that's the idea of a quantum computation. Now, we're familiar with devices like this, which work sometimes. Um, a, a, and I don't mean one of these. I mean a, quantum, a, compu a computer based on quantum mechanics using these funny angle bracket things, these qubits, these two-state quantum systems, these polarized photons, if you like. So the idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to look at this as a, as a theoretical abstraction, but as I said, uh, the, the, the devices are coming, we hope. We've, we've, we have an input string, a sequence of zeros and ones. I'm now going to make them into this sequence of, if you like, polarized photons or, or two-state quantum systems. The computation itself is then an evolution. Essentially, I have to engineer some sort of interaction between these to change the state. And then finally, at the output, I'm going to make a, a measurement. So here's a, a sort of block diagram, very simplistic uh, model of what a, a quantum processor would look like. This is the number that I'm interested in. So this, is the this A denotes this sort of sequence of zeros and ones. For technical reasons I won't go into, you need another register as well of zeros. And what it produces at the output is whatever function you want, a function of that number. So here's the number I put in, and this register is the readout, and that's the original function coming out. And, and at that level, it looks very much like any other kind of processor. Give it some data, read an output. But the superposition principle tells us that I don't have to put just one number in, I can put in a superposition of different numbers. In fact, I can put in a, if, if I've got n of these bits, I can put in a superposition of all numbers between 1 and 2 to the n at the same time. So I'm putting not one number in, but two to the n. Just to give you some idea, what that means is that, let's suppose that I've got 100 bits. That means that this processor, in principle, calculates more than a million million different numbers at the same time on a single processor. And that's why, that's a, it's this very simple idea that underlies the uh, interest and potential revolution of quantum computers. Problems that would be completely in, um, inaccessible on a conventional processor should, with a quantum computer, be uh, a doable. For example, this, uh, this diagram is, is, is an indication, if you like, of the family of problems which are so-called, the computer scientists call them P-solvable problems. That's not really important. For P-solvable, just read that what we mean is they are doable with realistic amounts of resources. That's, that's what we mean by P-solvable. This uh, pink uh, blob is what we call classical deterministic algorithms. So conventional programming sits inside this blob. Um, for reasons that I've always found really rather surprising, um, if you allow a little bit of randomness in your algorithm, a little bit of stochasticity, probabilistic behavior, the, slight, the family of problems you can solve realistically actually gets bigger. And that's a poor choice of color, I'm afraid. This says quantum computing at the bottom. And the quantum computing is a bigger set still and allows you to solve certain problems of interest like factoring, discrete logarithm, quantum simulations. Wait a minute, factoring? Factoring. Hmm. Let me suppose that the number I'm interested in is n. And let's say for the sake of argument that this n is the product of two large prime numbers. And, I, and typically that will have little n uh, digits in it, binary digits in it. So it's going to be a number of the order of the size of 2 to the n. And the important question is, how long does it take me to run this, to solve this, any particular problem as a function of capital N or little n? Now, one very simple example is, let me suppose I have a function. X is a, X is a number between uh, 1 and 2 to the n. And it's going to be periodic. In other words, if I add a certain number to that, uh, add, an, add a number to x, I get the same value. And your task is to find that r. <coughs> Well, the best-known classical algorithm for doing this takes of the order of n steps. So in other words, more, the, the bigger you make the number, the bigger the problem gets, and it's proportional. 
Or in other words, if I, add a, if I add more bits, every time I add another bit, another binary digit to my number, I double the difficulty, is the way to understand it. A quantum computer, which we don't have yet, has been shown to work like n squared. So for example, if n were 100, this is this, billion, uh, this million million, and this is 10,000. And the bigger the numbers get, the bigger the divergence between these two. This is considered to be a solvable problem in computer science. This is considered to be an unsolvable problem because it just gets too big too quickly. So this is solvable. The um, bombshell was really dropped when Peter Shaw published his factoring algorithm. And the idea was, let's take a number n, which is the product of two large prime numbers, and your task is to find p and q given n. Well, the first thing you might try and do is, well, let's just try all of the numbers up to, well, you only have to go up to the square root of n, of course, to find the factors, and that tells you that the problem scales rather like this one. It's exponential in the number of bits, 2 to the power n. The best published algorithm, the best known algorithm, scales in this horrendous way, 2 to the power n to the third log to the two-thirds of n. And this, this to me, more, elo more eloquently than anything else, explains how important this problem is. The fact that somebody has worked hard enough to prove that that rather horrible scaling is, what is, is, is the limiting behavior as I say, indicates how important the problem is. But it's still exponential. It's still 2 to the power of something, 2 to the, two to the power of n. Shaw's algorithm is polynomial in n. So again, in computer science terms, on a quantum computer, this is a solvable problem. It's an exponential speed up. But let's think back. Remember that the difficulty in cracking RSA, public key crypto systems, is thought to be equivalent to the difficulty of solving this problem, of finding p and q for n. What's known for sure is that if you can solve this problem, then RSA becomes a solvable problem as well. Or in other words, public key crypto systems become solvable. The way in which, they're ba the way in which your banks exchange secure information, the way in which you buy things over the internet, also becomes a solvable problem, a crackable problem. A, a hacker with enough computing resource could get it, with a quantum computer, could get into these transactions. Remember that this public key crypto system is also the way in which banks spend money. So a hacker with a, with a quantum computer as a resource could spend money on behalf of the Bank of England. And all of the security systems that we currently use, all of the electronic-based security systems, are based on this RSA, which becomes crackable if the quantum computer comes along. So let me, in order to leave some time for questions, let me go back and hopefully explain the origins of this uh, title. So let's start with the security. All of the communications, the electronic communications that we have, including the financial transactions, are protected by techniques that rely on the difficulty of certain mathematical operations, and in particular, this factoring problem. Of course, we all know that the more we communicate, the more we're under threat. And as, we, as I've, I've tried to emphasize, real money, and indeed real power, is data. It's numbers on computer files. And we, you, we now routinely, and indeed the banks and governments as well, routinely exchange this information uh, electronically. My favorite bit, the paranoia. Quantum computers, when they become available, uh, a few years ago I'd have said if, but I'm, I'm becoming more optimistic, when they become available, will rend all current secure protocols uh, insecure uh, overnight. Um, somebody who can build one of these will render money valueless. So money could become valueless as well. Quantum key distribution, this simple idea based on polarized photons, is a radically different approach to secure communications, and it's one that's based not on prime numbers or factoring problems, but on the laws of quantum mechanics. And the take-home message is that if quantum computers are around, this is the only currently, this is the only current candidate for secure communications in a world with quantum computers. The good news is, however, for those of you who may be getting a little bit paranoid about this, this technology is way ahead of that one. <laughs> and in, in particular, um, a prototype for quantum ATM transactions. So for ATM transactions which are protected not by a PIN number but by one of these quantum exchanges was announced by researchers at the University of, of Bristol in November of last year. So it's coming. So let me conclude by pointing out what every scientist and every, I expect every other academic in this room knows and that is that you don't do this stuff by yourself. I've been fortunate enough to work with a splendid team uh, over, the, over the last, well, nearly 20 years on this subject First and foremost, Simon Phoenix and his colleagues at British Telecom, with whom we started uh, way back when, and of course uh, my, uh, uh, my students over the years. Uh, I'd also like to thank, um, in particular, 
the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, both for the honour that they've done in inviting me to lecture this evening, but also for the support which they've given to me over many years, including allowing me to come to Scotland in the first place. Thank you all very much. accounts and uh, withdrawing your money, putting it into Northern Rock, something like that, <laughs> safety. Uh, so I, 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 fortunately we have time for some questions and I'm sure that, that uh, you'll have uh, many to put forward and the uh, speaker will do his best, do my best to answer them, but some of them may be secret, he may not be allowed to. You never know. Oh, I'm a bit of an anarchist. <laughs> right. Now if you want us to answer the question, put up your hand, wait till the, one of the two microphones reaches you and then speak with the microphone close to your mouth and be brief. So with the microphone, find this lady here in the front. If you want to say who you are, you can. If you're a secret, you need to be <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm just a member of the public, and I want to know what the difference is in order of magnitude between a supercomputer and your quantum computers. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say something really glib, like a, a quantum computer will make a supercomputer seem like an abacus. Uh, but that's not entirely fair. But what is fair to say is that it, it's a, an entirely revolutionary uh, process. We're talking about this, uh, this scaling law, this ability to solve, to making problems solvable, means that you can solve problems that, in principle, we used to do it in silicon, would eat up all of the silicon on the planet in a computer and still not be enough. Uh, this, is the wonder of, uh, this is the wonder of this power law scaling. When you go from something which, which increases exponentially to something which increase, increases, say, for example, like the square or just linearly, that's the difference that, that occurs at very large numbers. And so it, it's, it's not a fair comparison because it's such a different technology. But as I say, suffice it to say, that you can very rapidly get to numbers for this factoring problem, which would not be solvable in any realistic time scale using the entire um, uh, silicon, out, uh, uh, silicon making up the planet. But in a quantum computer, in principle, would be solvable. So, so it, it, it's a completely different idea. It will be able to solve problems that no computer, no conventional computer, will ever be able to solve because they're just too big. Point of question there, thank you. The one microphone on this side. Yes, very interesting talk. From your description of the satellite-based version of quantum cryptography, it sounded as if the satellite would have to store the number while it orbited from London to New York, which suggests that the users would have to trust the the builder and the operator of the satellite, which would sort of seem to defeat the, the purpose? Or is there some way of storing this uh, that's superposition true. state in the no, satellite? that's true. That's true. And so, like a lot of these things, you do need some kind of, some kind of uh, trusted agency. And, and of course, in much the same way as you would have to say, well, I put my money in, in the bank and I, and I trust them. So you do need, that's, that, that, that's quite correct. But of course, the, the plus side, you actually know who it is you're trusting. So, so essentially you can take out some indemnity or some kind of insurance against these guys um, uh, being leaky. So yes, you need, a, you need a trusted intermediary. If somebody else can get into the satellite and or monitor what's happening in it, uh, you're, you're finished. That's true. One gentleman there. Just uh, further to that, uh, the quantum communication that you're talking about there, it's more for protecting the information in transit, a secure communications link. If you get into storage, is there any way of using quantum technology to help there? Because obviously that would then become a weak spot to be targeted. If you've, you know, because obviously we, in, when we're dealing with that information, it's also the storage of it which is an issue as well. Oh yes. Does yeah, quantum mechanics so. help at there at all? Not so far. Not so far. It's the the, the um, with all of these with all of these problems, there's always a, a point at which at which you, you lose the security. Ultimately, or well, very often, it's people's carelessness. But also, ultimately, if you're typing away on the computer and somebody's looking over your shoulder, that's the weak link. So what we're trying to do is push that weak link more and more into physically isolated systems. Uh, as I mentioned, one, the, the, the classic way to, to keep things safe is to physically isolate them. And if you don't need to communicate, if banks don't need to talk to each other, if you don't need to have an online account and so if you don't need an ATM, that's actually very good. Physical isolation works very well, but it's the communication part which is, which, is the, which is perceived as the weak link. And so this is a step to try and solve that communication part. But no, it doesn't buy you security. It, 
it, you know, if, you're, if you leave the numbers on your desk, that's it. If you put everything on, if you put all of the secure information on a laptop and take it home for the weekend and lose it, that doesn't help either. So, so yeah, yeah. There's in front of you there. You had to put your hand out very high to be seen. <laughs> Next time round, we'll get you. Thanks very much for the lecture. It's very interesting. Um, just a quick question. Is a one-time pad, the one that we talked about earlier, is that vulnerable to quantum attack, or is no, that it's itself not. safe? No, no. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the only proven um, completely secure system. And it works purely because the... If the key is truly a random number, then by modulo addition, essentially what you're doing is you're taking a random number, and if, it's, if, if, the, if, if, the key, if the digit in the random number is a zero, you flip the bit in the message, and if it's a one, you don't. And so if that's truly a secret and random key, the message also is random, and therefore contains no information unless you have a copy of the key. So that's proven secure. Can you do the <coughs> gentleman here? Are you right? right. You seem to be indicating something which could destabilize the Western world. Uh, could Mr. Bin Laden be sitting in his Afghan cave working on some scheme to do just that? Or are the international police forces working on some scheme of theirs? Um, I hope he is. I hope he is, because it's hard, and he'll never get there. Um, I, a lot of very clever people are working very hard on this, using an awful lot of government for money in very many different Western uh, countries. In some sense, the safest thing, that we're, at interest, we're at an interesting stage of development. At some stage, I would suggest, the best protection we have is the, pu is the public community of scientists. The fact that people like me and my colleagues meet up a few times a year and talk about where we're up to, visit each other's labs and so on. At this stage, we've got a pretty good idea of what everybody is up to and how far they've got. It's when some of the um, front-running institutions stop publishing that I'll start taking the money out of the bank and hiding it in a mattress. Computers are ever built. It seems that they've got a far more potential than, than simply factorizing uh, these numbers. Um, can you, can you speculate on that? Yes, yes, that's a very good point. Um, of course, I concentrated on factoring um, because of the subject of the talk, um, secure, secure communications, but also because it was very much this idea that caught the world's attention. Uh, until this came along, it was something that uh, people like me did in, in the back room, published in our journals, and nobody cared very much. But, but of course, the, the big plan or the big hope for quantum computers is that it can solve, as I said, problems that can't be done on any conventional computer. And the front runner in that is actually simulating quantum systems themselves. So for example, if you wanted to understand how at the microscopic level um, some nano device, in, uh, some a nanoscope, uh, nano length device behaves, if you wanted to build a molecule atom by atom and understand what happens as you build it atom by atom, if you wanted to know all the properties of some horribly complicated drug which you want to synthesize before you built it, to solve those sort of problems, you need to have, and these are quantum systems, you need to have something which is much more powerful than conventional computers. And that's a, that's a possible force for good. The ability, for example, to simulate DNA from first principles. <clears throat> The family of uh, photonic variations that you described, the horizontal, vertical, and the polarizations, surely it is quite a difficult problem getting a generator of all these different varieties of photon. No? No. It's, it's, and uh, putting it into a reasonable size for a computer of uh, practical application. Well, well uh, okay. I see what you mean. Um, to, to, to control polarization of of, of, of light, and, or even at, the single, even at the very low light levels, is, um, well, I, I'm a theorist and I've done it, so, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so it's doable. Um, to bring all these things together and make some computing engine out of them is very hard. And um, it's possible it will, be done with, it will be done with photons. There are other candidates as well, electronic levels in quantum dots or in trapped ions and so on. There are many candidate systems. And the truth is that at the moment, they, have their, they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. Um, if I were to put it on a sort of scale between working with sort of the elementary physics lab and the computer at the end, we're round about the level of the transistor. 
we can, the, the best groups in the world can build things which are comparable in complexity. Of course, we're not trying to build transistors, but if you, if you keep that picture in mind uh, of that sort of level, something approaching the sort of the region of the first integrated circuit is foreseeable. And what happens after that, of course, is... But, of course, nobody really knows if it'll be photons or ions or whatever other system, and people are working on all of them. More questions? Oh, yeah. Well, could I pursue that one? I mean, obviously, the question of the practical um, development of physical quantum computers is the, sort of, is the big question. Um, but I suppose one... I want to ask how likely it is or what. I suppose the, the good test of that is how much money people are spending on it. I mean, if, if, if governments and companies are spending billions of dollars on it, then one must believe that somebody takes it as a serious possibility. If they're all you can get is a few hundred dollars to your lab work, obviously nobody takes it seriously. So which is it? Uh, it's much bigger than a few hundred dollars, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thankfully. Um, in, in the UK, uh, well, as I say, this is still science. It's not building devices yet. The UK has its own um, uh, quantum information interdisciplinary research centre, which is a collaboration of about a dozen, yes, a dozen or so universities and and um, labs like Hewlett Packard and so on. There's a huge group in the States at the National Institute of Standards who are one of the front runners. The big computer companies are involved. There's um, a trans. There's a, a, a group, a large grouping in Australia, which has uh, all of the major groups involved. There's a Canadian network. There are several big European networks, and so. Uh, it's being taken very. It's being taken very seriously. And, in, and I have to be honest. In, in the level of, in the average level of sort of funding within the academic community, it's funded rather well. Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, you touched on it just there, and you mentioned that the uh, the processing power that a quantum computer could come up with, you wouldn't be able to find enough silicon. Presumably, the um, the physicality of a quantum computer would be kind of nothing like we've seen before and you wouldn't be able to have silicon in it to kind of process or transmit the amount of data that you could, you, can you envisage any sort of how the physicality would, would be of a quantum computer? There, there, are, there are prototype systems. I mean, let me describe to you my favorite, uh, not because I think it's particularly the front runner, but, I, uh, but it's my favorite and it'll give you some idea of the whiz bang of this, of this sort of stuff. Um, take an ion, so, so take one atom, rip an electron off so it's charged. You can, you can trap that ion, you can control it, you can keep it essentially stationary, you can reduce it to, to the, to, so essentially it's for all its motion is frozen out. You can make a string of them, and because and, and they have the same charge, they force each other apart, and they're separated like that. Now that register of about 10 of these things is a 10 qubit register. You can, you can get each one of the, you can isolate two electronic levels in one of these, you can get them to talk to each other by making the chain shuffle backwards and forwards and freeze the motion out. So, the present things are a huge vacuum can, more lasers than you could point a stick at, optical tables and so on, but at the, at the core of it, a distance of maybe a few microns across is a, a collection of trapped ions talking to each other and behaving very much like this, this elementary processor, but only at the level of 10 qubits, not 100. So a 10-bit register, not a 100-bit register. But if I'd been giving this talk five years ago, it would have been three, not 10. So, and that's, 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 that's one example, probably one of the more mature technologies. Follow up question. Long before, or at least before the first quantum computer actually is going to be built, presumably people are going to start to play safe and to start using alternative systems. So they don't want to get caught unawares when the thing actually appears. So the, you mentioned there was there was something which was much more closely to being realised, which actually was a safe uh, procedure. So do you see people altering their whole current uh, means of transmitting information in order to? false tall being caught out when the this quantum computer well, finally I appears. Um, very much so. Mm. And of course that's one of the um, uh, satellite experiments are very expensive. Satellite systems are very expensive. But one of the reasons um, why people are taking seriously and why, why in particular funding agencies like the European Space Agency are taking seriously the idea of communications quantum key distribution via satellites is precisely for this mm. reason. Any, any more questions? You're all satisfied? You're going to go home and sleep soundly? I, 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 I'm sorry, but I have to say, I, I, I do actually carry an ATM card. So don't, don't do Well, thank you. I, I'll ask Miles Paget to move over to thanks. The, 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 the very 
rubbish joke that we tell, isn't there, about how many scientists it takes to change a light bulb. Well, tonight we've at least found out how many scientists it takes to plug a laptop in. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve at least has an excuse, being a theorist. I, as an experimentalist, uh, sadly, can't, can't resort to that. Um, so we'll, re we'll really know if we're in trouble if someone invents a computer that doesn't need to be plugged in. That would be really, be really something, wouldn't it? Um, before I, I move uh, to a formal vote of thanks, I've just got a, a thanks to say of my own. Um, I remember very clearly, in fact, something like seven years ago, um, I was over at a meeting here, and uh, I, I was driving back uh, to see my then girlfriend, now wife, in Glasgow, and uh, I was giving Steve a lift. And uh, Steve said to me, I hear you're moving to Glasgow, Miles. And uh, I said, yes, uh, Steve, I, I am moving to Glasgow. And I, we'd sort of, I'd, I'd known Steve for a number of years, never, never worked with him. And uh, I have to say, leaving aside all the obvious benefits of uh, now living in the same city as my now wife, which is a very good reason for moving to Glasgow, um, possibly the most exciting thing for me in, in my move to Glasgow, academically speaking, has been the, the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Steve there. So thank you very much for that as well, Steve. And on that note, I would like if we could just all join and thank Steve for an excellent lecture. I, I think the President and I can agree it was exactly the right balance of maths and no maths. <laughs> and a little joke for Miles, uh, for Steve here rather, at least there was no Miles maths in it, Steve. <laughs> right, so thank you very much. Well, just before you go, just let me thank the James Scott trustees for supporting the lectureship, which you just heard, and to tell you that uh, the next uh, lecture here at the RSE is the uh, Peter Wilson lecture, uh, which will be given by uh, the, our General Secretary, Professor Jeffrey Bolton, uh, who is also Vice Principal of Edinburgh University.